Okay. Uh, we're going to make protein. Now, where do we get amino acids to make protein in the human body? We ingest it. We've got to eat it. So we eat a cow. We eat chicken. Some of us that don't, you know, would rather pet a, a chicken or pet a cow, they would get it from beans, right, tofu, uh, stuff like that. Um, but the rest of us that love the tasty, yummy meat flavoring, we'd eat a cow or a chicken or a pig, right, or a fish. And now, we don't just take that and slap it on our, you know, our legs and our biceps. So if I eat beef, I don't get beef muscle. If I, get, I eat pork, I don't get pork brain. Right? Stuff like that. What we do is, that if this is protein, protein's a long chain of amino acids. If I eat it, it goes in my body, and my body does this. It breaks it all apart. Every single bit of it. So when people go, you can't eat that. That will make you, you know, it's, it's, that's not a healthy or clean animal. Well, if you clean it, right? Like, if it's not dirty, there's no uh, feces on it or anything like that. The meat's just meat. Your body's going to take it and break it up into amino acids in the end. So, you know, in certain countries, they don't eat cow because they're, they're, they're holy, right? The holy cows, whatever. But, but when it comes to protein, it's just protein. Some people don't eat pigs because they think they're dirty. But, you know, if you, 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 you farm it and slaughter it right, it's edible just as protein, right? So the protein part is protein. Um, so what we need to do is figure out how do we take those amino acids that we have from eating meats and put them back together, okay? And this is translation. So this little, this picture here reviews uh, transcription. So what you got on top is your DNA strand, that little uh, sideways egg, that is your RNA uh, polymerase. And you can see it open it up because there's a promoter sequence there. And out came this mRNA sequence right there. And then this mRNA sequence is right here. And then we'll cut out the introns and we'll have a mature piece of mRNA. And this bubble closes when it reaches the termination sequence, right? And that guy just fell off and we have our mRNA. So we got to figure out what does this do now, okay? Well, that gets translated. We need to make a protein. A simple protein is called a polypeptide chain. Poly means many. Okay? So we're going to put a whole bunch of these amino acids together, and that would be called a polypeptide chain. Okay? So the monomer, or the single thing, is called an amino acid, monomer. When we put two together, three together, four together, we get something called a polymer. And eventually, we get a really long chain of amino acids, and we call that a polypeptide. And people are saying, well, what about protein? Well, if we fold this correctly, this is called alpha helixing. Sometimes it does something called beta pleated sheeting. If it folds correctly and then comes together, multiple groups of polypeptide chains can come together, we would get a functioning protein. And for us, it would be eye color, right? We've always been talking about brown eye color. So brown eye color might require multiple pieces of polypeptide proteins coming together to make a big mass. We call it a globular structure. And that globular structure might do the job of showing up as brown in your eye. Okay? So let's see how that's done. Now remember, I was telling you that the alphabet for the, genetics, uh, for gene for the genetic code has four letters, uh, three-letter words. The three-letter words have a name called a codon. Up there is my DNA. Now, I took the bottom part off because what we're using the top part to, to make our pink mRNA. So there's my pink piece of mRNA. And now ribosomes are going to come, and they're going to read them. They're going to read these letters. And the ribosome reads in groups of three. There's one word, there's another word, there's a third word, there's a fourth word. The words, right, are called codons because they code for something. What do they code for? They code for a specific amino acid. So you guys have a list in front of you. This one right here, that is the genetic code. So without, you know, looking here, we should be able to figure out what UGG, right, the three uh, RNA nucleotides in that order, UGG code for. What does that code for? Well, you would look down here and you would try to find UUG. 
UGG, sorry, my, my bad, UGG, right here. It's tryptophan. And the three-letter abbreviation for tryptophan is TRP. Now, instead of just sliding over one and reading the next three, it slides over three and reads the next three. So now it's U, U, U. And then we just look here and we see, oh, it's phenylalanine. And then we slide over three more, and it's GGC, and it's glycine. And then we slide over another three, and it's UCA, and that's uh, serine. And so on, and so on, and so on. Now, there, there will be thousands and thousands of amino acids in this chain. They just keep trucking. As it's growing, we call that term elongation. And then once the ribosome gets to a, a place where it says stop, it would just fall off, and then you'd have this polypeptide chain. Okay. Now, there are 64 different codes you can have. Three of them are stop codons, so that leaves you 61 that actually code for amino acids, but there's only 20 amino acids. So there's a redundancy, right? So we have multiple ways of saying the same thing, okay? And if you take a look at this list, some of them have uh, three different ways to say the same thing, isoleucine. Some of them have two ways to say the same thing, leucine and, and uh, cysteine. Some have four different ways to say the same thing, glycine, valine, leucine, arginine, proline. Some of them have even more. Uh, I believe one has uh, six. Which one has six? Do you see it there? Proline, no. Yeah. Phenylalanine? No. Anyways, as you can see, but there are a couple with just one. Here's one with just one, methionine. And another one with just one is tryptophan. Okay, all the rest have more than one. Tryptophan and methionine have one. And uh, let's just point out the stop codons right there and UAA, UAG. So there, there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways to say the same thing. Only methionine and tryptophan have the one. Okay. We call that a redundancy. And I'll show you why the redundancy is important a little bit later. So what we need to do is get a start codon. We need to start initiation. So what happens is, here's our mRNA for brown eyes. And what comes along is now, it's not RNA polymerase, it's another chemical called ribosome. And ribosome comes along and starts reading this thing. And what it's looking for is a start codon. The start codon is always the same start. And it is always AUG it is always methionine. The first amino acid is always methionine. That's the start codon. So it'll go down, 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 down. There's a whole bunch of other stats, but we're going to oversimplify it and just say, oh, it found a methionine. Start. And it'll add a methionine. Okay. So here it is. There's my ribosome. It slides down the mRNA until it finds a start codon. The start codon is AUG. And so this is mRNA. The pink is M, uh, sorry, rRNA. And then we have the green thing, which is tRNA. It's the transfer. It's bringing the methionine. There's the methionine. It brought the methionine over. And now this ribosome, a second piece comes there and locks it in. It's just like handcuffs it in there. It's like, ah, uh, we got it. We got the start. Methionine. And now it will slide over three and look at UCA. What does UCA code for, guys? So let's take a look. UCA, serine. The next amino acid is going to be serine. So how does it come? Well, there's another tRNA with a serine on its top here that's going to line up right here. Now, how does it know to line up? Because it can read the UCA. It reads it with its foot. Its foot here has the complementary amino acid sequence, sorry, nucleotide sequence. What's the complementary uh, code to UCA, do you think? Yeah, AGU, right? So it's got, we call it the complementary foot. It's like magnets. So it's going to snap in place. Let me show you the, how it slaps in place. So tRNA brings in the mRNA. Each tRNA top has an amino acid and a unique foot with the anticodon, we, we call it. 
So arginine, here's the anticodon foot, GCG. Well, what does it match up to on the mRNA? CGC, like magnets, snap. So for other ones, Sophie said it should have been ACU, right? ACU. I think you said that. AGU? Okay, AGU. So let's take a look if that's the case. Okay, so that anticodon foot is going to match up. And then that is the amino acid that's going to be bound together. Okay? So the order of the mRNA tells the order of the tRNAs to come in. That means we know the order of the amino acids. The ribosome moves over and the next one comes in. We can have several ribosomes doing this at the same time. Okay? So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to join the amino acids together, and the bond that we create is something called a peptide bond. And the process, the chemical reaction, is called a dehydration synthesis reaction. It's a really complicated name. So let's take a look. So there's our methionine. It slid over three, and now it's looking for UCA, and what matches up is AGU. There it is, serine. Serine plops in like a magnet right there. And then the ribosome enzymatically attaches the two heads together. The chemical uh, process is called dehydration synthesis. Then it slides over three. When it slides over three, this one falls off. Now, because this lost its head, guess what it's going to go do? It's going to go find another head of methionine. And GAG, that is the codon. Can anyone tell me what GAG codes for? In front of you? What does it code for? Glutamate? Yeah, glutamate. What's the anticode on foot then? What's going to be the foot on the tRNA that lock? CUC. CUC glutamate. That's the one that's going to come in next. It's going to read it, slide over, um, enzymatically join them together using something called dehydration synthesis. Now, this can happen multiple times because sometimes you need a lot of these proteins. So if this is my mRNA, we could have one ribosome sliding down, making protein like that. But right behind it, we could have another ribosome sliding behind it, making more of that same protein right behind it. You could have like a whole bunch of ribosomes on this one stretch of mRNA making lots and lots of protein all at the same time. Okay? Now, this, this thing won't last forever. This is organic. right? Like, ref, like if you take out milk and leave it on the counter, how long does that last for? Now, take that milk and put it at 37 degrees centigrade. It's going to go bad. right? So this thing doesn't last forever. So if you want more protein made, you have to keep going. And if this thing breaks down, you have to make more RNA from the nucleus. Okay? So, and that's why some people get sick, because their body stops producing transcripts. Okay, they don't have enough uh, transcripts. This is a picture of that. This is called a polysome. One ribosome, two ribosome, three ribosome, four ribosome, five, six ribosomes, all on one stretch of mRNA, making a whole bunch of protein all at once. <clears throat> so here's another example. There's my double-strand DNA. We open it up. We copy this one. Right, mRNA. My codon is G, CGG, so the anticodon for is GCC. The amino acid is arginine. This one, codon 2, it jumps over 3. UAC is the mRNA sequence. The anticodon foot would be AUG, that's triosine, tyrosine, sorry, tyrosine. And then next one is UGG, that's the codon. The anticodon foot would be ACC. That makes tryptophan. So that's my three amino acid polypeptide chain. Now, it can't go on forever, right? Eventually, it needs to stop. And what we do is we get to a stop sequence. And the stop sequence, there's three of them. A, sorry, UAA, UAG, and our third one is UGA. Your ribosome will get there. Say, oh, it stopped. It does something called a hairpin loop. Uh, whatever, it's a little bit too much information. It falls off. The protein falls off. And now this protein 
You might say we're done. No, remember it has a fold. So this is called secondary and tertiary folding. And then sometimes you get two pieces joining together. We call that quaternary structure. So there's like three more steps after that. And then now this could be the protein. This could be the protein that gives you your brown eyes. Okay. All right. Little video clip. Translation was initiated by formation of an initiation complex consisting of the smaller ribosomal subunit, the first amino acid tRNA, and AUG. The larger ribosomal Start. subunit then joins the complex. Proteins called initiation factors are also involved but are not shown. The 70S ribosome has two sites to which transfer RNA carrying amino acids can bind. One is called the peptidyl or P site, and the other is called the acceptor or A site. The initiating transfer RNA carrying its amino acid binds to the P site. A transfer RNA that recognizes the next codon and carries the second amino acid then moves into the A site. See how they're complementary? The amino acid carried by the transfer RNA in the P site is then joined to the amino acid carried by the transfer RNA that just entered the A site. That's dehydration the synthesis. Now advances a distance of one codon and the first transfer RNA is released. And that one will go find a new amino acid. RNA carrying the next amino acid now moves into the A site and the ribosome shifts down by a distance of one codon. This is followed by the two amino acids on the transfer RNA in the P site being transferred to the third amino acid. The ribosome continues to move along the messenger RNA and new amino acids are added to the growing polypeptide chain. So there you go. Those are called peptide bonds when they're joining together. And it, 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 the elongation of the polypeptide is terminated when the ribosome reaches a codon that does not code for an amino acid called a stop codon. The ribosome dissociates into the smaller and larger subunits and the messenger RNA and protein are released. And that's it. Then you have that polypeptide chain that will fold, 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 fold. Now they talk about P site and A site. In fact, this example has an E and a P as well as an A site. So like, it gets more and more complicated. But there is our mRNA. There's our one piece of our ribosome. There's our second piece of ribosome. There's our first start codon. That's our first methionine, right? And then it just slides over, adds the next one in, slides over, adds the next one in, and keeps going, and keeps going until it gets to a stop codon. And then everything just falls apart and it's released, okay? And then that polypeptide chain can now be a protein. Last little video that summarizes it all, uh, this, this little translation process, you'll see how fast it is. This animation demonstrates how the digital information encoded within DNA is used to direct protein synthesis. This is a DNA double helix containing the digital code which directs the cell in all aspects of operation. And here we see a protein complex called an RNA polymerase traveling down the DNA strand. As it moves down the strand, it carefully unwinds the DNA, preparing it for transcription. Inside the polymerase, we see a single-stranded copy of the original instructions being assembled as individual bases are positioned and added to the growing strand. A stop code marks the end of the protein specification, at which point this copy, known as a messenger RNA transcript, exits the polymerase and heads towards a two-part chemical manufacturing machine called the ribosome. While the messenger RNA moves towards the ribosome, transfer RNA molecules attach to specific amino acids in preparation for assembly. As the messenger RNA transcript passes through the ribosome, the process of translation begins. Using the instructions encoded on the messenger RNA as a template, the transfer RNA molecules align specific sequences of bases to corresponding amino acids, creating a protein chain. As this chain exits the ribosome, it is met by chaperones which prevent premature folding while escorting the protein to a barrel-shaped machine called a chaperonin.
This machine helps fold the protein into the precise shape required to perform its function. Although it is unclear how the chaperonin achieves this, we do know that accurate folding is essential in order for the protein to accomplish its intended function. Once the protein is complete, it is released into the cytoplasm to do its job. There's the protein in its quaternary shape, final shape. And that's it. So we got half an hour or so. I thought what we could do now is uh, go over this little worksheet together. We'll do the first one together and then the rest of the time you can finish it off. You got some stuff to do at home, so I don't want you to take this home if you can finish it now. Um, I won't collect it though. We'll, we'll get it from you um, digitally as well because, because of this, uh, this, uh, this, well, obviously because of the COVID thing. Okay, so here we go. You have to have two sheets out. You have to have um, your genetic code as well as you have to have our worksheet. So let's take a look at the worksheet. We're going to do the first one first. So here it says this is our mRNA transcript. So what we need to do is figure out what the DNA uh, was that coded for this. So what was the one, uh, you know, the, 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 the stretch of DNA that was read to make the mRNA? And it looks like, to me, TAC. Everyone agree? Okay, TAC. Now, we know the start codon on mRNA is AUG. You can also look at DNA and look for the start codon on DNA, and it would be TAC. It's a TAC codon. Okay. All right, let's keep trucking along. What's the next one, do you think? A goes with T. G goes with C. A goes with U because it's DNA and not RNA. So you just keep trucking along and see what you get. If you get stuck, take a look up here and you can and, and cross check it with mine. Oh shoot, I put a U there, that would be wrong. Oh. Now we need to know what the polypeptide sequence is. What's the amino acid sequence? So I made a whole bunch of mistakes last class because I kept looking at the top row, so I'm gonna cover it up and then you're gonna look for my start sequence. Oh. AUG is methionine. That's my start sequence. So I'm going to put that in right away. MET. Now you can see down here, we don't start until over here, right? The first amino acid would be here. Because AUG, not AAU. Uh, A -A 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 -G, sorry. Uh, lysine. So that's L-Y-S. A lot of them can be abbreviated with three letters. The first three, and if there's uh, two with the first three, then uh, you have to look it up. I know some of them. UUU, phenylalanine, phenylalanine, GGC, GGC, glycine, GCA is alanine. Tell me if I screw up. I screwed up last time. UUG, leucine, ACC, 309. And ACA, I got 309 again. Is that right? Did you get 309 twice? Okay. And then UAC. Oh, this game is so hard. Tyrosine. And then finally UAA. Is that stop? Yeah, okay. So there's nothing there. It just stops. Okay, good. Now, you remember I was saying there's a whole bunch of different ways to say the same word. Um, and that, it's called redundancy. And the redundancy in the genetic code is really important because if you look up here, uh, let's just pretend that, uh, you, you know, in, during the summer you didn't have much to do. So you just ended up hanging out at the uh, beach the whole time, right? So for 12 hours a day, you went out to the beach. You didn't wear your SPF 4 million. Right? You just went out there and you put a little olive oil on there just to keep your skin moist. But you just like you sunned yourself to death. And what could happen is UV sunlight could come in there 
and it could actually cause something called a point mutation. Okay, let's just pretend some UVC light, some really high energy UV light came in there and changed that to a C in your genetics. So instead of saying CCG, now it says CCC. Right? Well, that would change just to GGG. And now take a look what happens to your, your, your amino acid sequence. Oh, fortunately for you, it's the same thing. It's still G glycine. That's why the redundancy in the genetic code is, is, is important. Because you could have all these little point mutations and it could keep it from making any drastic changes. In, in fact, it could be exactly the same. So what that means is that your amino acid, your protein folds up exactly the same and it works exactly the same. Now, what if, let's go along and change this story a little bit and say, okay, you, you, you just missed getting a bad you know, genetic uh, change. So uh, next year, uh, you feel pretty brave. You do it again. And this time, the point mutation happens here, and that changes to a G. So now it's GCC instead of CCG. Now what happens here? That changes to a C as well. And now you got CGG, proline. Did the redundancy in the code help you here? No, it didn't. So is it foolproof? No. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And most people go bad, right? They go mutation, bad. But there's always three outcomes for a mutation, positive, negative, neutral. So even though that this change from glycine to proline, maybe it still folds up exactly the same way. Maybe the active site, the site that does work, is exactly the same. Or it could actually make it work better. You guys have to remember, through evolutionary time, you guys evolved from slime in the ocean to us right now, this multicellular organism that can uh, you know, have hi higher level thought. And that's because of mutation. You guys are X-men and women. You're, you've mutated. So even though we always say mutations are bad, it's not always bad. It's necessary for evolution. And sometimes it's neutral. There's no uh, positive or negative outcome. Okay? And that's called the redundancy in the genetic code. And that's why it's important in keeping us from developing disorders and stuff like that. Okay? Because we're pretty sure the status quo is okay even though we need it for uh, evolutionary sakes. Any questions on this uh, worksheet? Now, uh, if I can get your attention, let me just shift down here. I'm not going to do the whole thing for you, but check out this one. Number four, methionine. Does everyone agree that that should be AUG and that should be TAC on the DNA? Well, how about valine? Well, valine can be G, U, but it can be U, C, A, or G. So here, what I would do is actually show your teacher, that happens to be me, that you know that it can be any of those four. It's G, U, U, or G, U, C, or G, U, A, or G, U, G. And this is why it's, it's a bit challenging to actually come up with the genetic code for proteins, to reverse it. It's, you know, going one way is really easy, but going the other way, you get this whole vomit of possible outcomes, like a lot of different ways to do it. And if you keep trucking along, you'll see there could be millions of different combinations of letters that get you the same thing, okay, for a gene. Okay, so if there's no questions, uh, you got about 20 minutes to try to finish this up in class, and then you can take it home, and we'll get a hand-in folder for you. Yeah, if they're both the same, usually the one with the N in it, right, glutamine, has a G-L-U-N spelling then. And this one would be G-L-U then. So if there's two common three letters, the one with the N in it, the N gets bumped up. Okay. Yeah, so that would be G-L-N and that would be still G-L-U. Yeah. Sure. Number two. Here, mm -hmm. it's that one, and then here, it's that one. Yeah. Again, this one has an N in it, so that N gets promoted to over there. So it's ASN, and then this one gets to be ASP. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. If you have 
two amino acids with the same three-letter abbreviation, you have to look at which one has, so here's a good one, glutamine and glutamate. GLU, GLU. They can't both be GLU. So the one with the letter N always gets the N promoted to, to the third letter. So G, glutamine becomes GLN. Glutamate, which doesn't have an N in it, stays GLU. That's the, that's the common practice. Okay. 